Watch this. Property tax relief. It's the constant rallying cry of every recent legislative session. The taxes keep going up, and the attempts to fix them more confusing. Two lawmakers are hoping their bills are part of the solution. Idaho prides itself on being a leader, but that's not necessarily the case when it comes to abortion laws. Anti-abortion activists are trying to model a new law after one already in place in Texas, but it's not that easy. Buy a 50-year-old home? It's bound to need some work. Layers of wear and tear. Not to mention the layers you didn't expect to find. Nearly two full years into the COVID-19 pandemic, a week into Idaho's second stretch of hospitals operating under crisis standards of care. And for the fourth time, the Idaho National Guard has been called on to help. It's a deployment of nearly 600 guardsmen and women. Most of them, 503, will assist hospitals overwhelmed with COVID patients and outbreaks among staff, something they've done before. And where positivity rates among those being tested, like within the St. Al's, St. Alphonsus Health System, it's gone from 20% at the beginning of this month to 46% a week ago. It's down slightly this week to 41%, but still a far cry from the 5% we are aiming for. This time, the governor specifically activated 75 Guard members to work with Primary Health and the Idaho Department of Correction. Primary Health has 26 urgent care clinics around the valley, and they have been hit hard by COVID with staffing shortages and overworked employees. As recently as last weekend, they had to close seven of those clinics completely, and they closed all the others early. Today, they have 26 people out, either sick or exposed, and they have four clinics closed. Just 4% of staff is out is an obvious improvement, but Dr. David Peterman, primary health CEO, says help is still needed and welcomed, saying they can't thank Governor Little enough for this help. Even with 96 to 97% of their staff vaccinated, Omicron knows no bounds, he says. Dr. Peterman went on, by activating the National Guard, we can test, evaluate, and treat even more people seeking COVID care. At the same time, freeing other health care staff to help patients needing non-COVID care. You know, like the other illnesses and injuries that happen on a daily basis. So the Guard will be in a sort of triage role for primary health and handling COVID testing, freeing up the rest of the staff to focus on their other patients. That will also mean reopening clinics and a return to normal operating hours. The positivity rate they are seeing at primary health is about 38% right now. Meanwhile, at the Department of Correction. As of this morning, I have 201 staff in the Department of Correction who are either out with COVID or who are out because of a direct exposure to someone else who tested positive. So you add that, you add those 200 staff that are no longer available to report with an already significant staffing crisis. And, and it, it's a situation that's just not tenable. That's Director Tewalt speaking to the House Judiciary and Rules Committee this afternoon, telling them 10% of his staff unable to come to work today and why this latest development is warranted. The Guard will be used at three prisons south of Boise in supporting roles, passing out meals, helping with counts, that kind of stuff. Week three of the legislative session and lots going on at the State House, and we're finally getting to the meat of the meal, property taxes. Kind of more like the liver and onions of the meal, probably, because let's be honest, while necessary, not exactly everyone's favorite topic. With exploding growth comes exploding property taxes. I mean, it's based on the value of your home, after all. And it's been a problem, specifically in Idaho's most populous cities, for a while now. Lawmakers did work to pass some property tax legislation last year, but some argue it actually created more problems. One example, seniors who lost qualifications to stay on the property tax reduction program. Others say the homeowner exemption needs to be increased to keep up with growing property values. Joe Paris, well, he holds his nose and tries to digest some early ideas on property tax solutions. At the end of the 2021 legislative session, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle agreed. Skyrocketing property taxes for Idahoans needed to be addressed. One area some lawmakers wanted and are now keying in on, helping seniors who are struggling to keep up with their property taxes as their home values continue to go up. There are a number of solutions that we need to be advancing to solve our property tax woes. Assistant House Minority Leader Democrat Laura Necochea says she drafted a bill to undo the consequences of the property tax legislation passed in 2021. They decided to kick about 2,000 seniors off of the property tax program just based on the value of their house. Uh, many of these seniors live in modest houses and they won't be able to uh, receive their property tax assistance anymore unless we take action. 
That legislation cut down on the amount of people who are now eligible for the state's property tax relief program. The idea behind the 2021 legislation was to prevent Idaho taxpayers from having to pay the bill on high-value homes that qualified for the assistance program. Nekochea says her bill would essentially reverse consequences of 2021 legislation while also expanding eligibility for the property tax relief program, commonly called the circuit breaker. It deletes restrictions that prevent people from accessing it, and it increases the income eligibility up to $50,000 a year. We know for, for a family of four just to get by in the state with costs, they need to earn $60,000, $65,000 a year and just to pay for basic necessities. And so this would raise income eligibility up to $50,000 a year per family. Right now, the income eligibility only covers up to $32,230. Nekochea's idea comes with a price tag of about $37 million. She says the investment could greatly help people struggling with property taxes. My bill would triple the number of families who can get property tax reduction assistance. But it's not just seniors who need the help. Republican Representative Greg Cheney has an idea to allow Idahoans who receive the homeowner's exemption to deduct up to half of their property tax payment from their state income taxes. It could effectively wipe out a lot of people's income tax liability to, to the state of Idaho, and it could uh, put that money back in people's pockets. So it's essentially getting half of what you pay in property taxes back uh, on your income taxes, uh, provided that you owe that much in income taxes, it wouldn't give you more than you owed. The proposed bill would also allow an income tax credit for Idaho residents for up to 10% of the property taxes they paid on a rental property. Cheney says he knows some will push back on the idea because they see it as the state bailing out local governments who are not controlling their budgets. Some argue that to curb the property tax issue, local governments need to scale back budgets so they don't need as many taxpayer dollars. The main criticism of it is it's the state budget uh, supplementing local bu budgets, but really what it is is it's the state budget giving back to uh, the taxpayer money that they've paid in. Cheney says getting creative to tackle the massive property tax topic is crucial. I think one of the, the big risks that we face is in any governing body is, is that we get tunnel vision and we start focusing in on one or two solutions. I think that oftentimes uh, that tunnel vision can be the reason why. So I think we need to stay open uh, to all ideas. That certainly is an interesting topic there that uh, Representative Cheney brought up, Joe. And just to be clear, it isn't the state that charges you a property tax. It's all of the taxing entities within your taxing district that take a portion of what your home's value is and all that kind of stuff. But that is for another topic. What about this homeowner's exemption? Any idea on that's going to be increased? Yeah, and it's been flat for a number of years, Brian, and there's a lot of lawmakers I've spoken with at the legislature that tell me there are people that want to see the homeowner's exemption go up. And right now you can exempt 50% of the value of your home and one acre of land for a maximum of $100,000 on your property tax. And that $100,000 max, it's been the same since 2017. And some argue that, yes, we need to increase it to keep up with prices. Some would like to see it up to $150,000 or $200,000 dollars depending on the area yeah they, these days that hundred thousand is pretty low number all right thank you very much joe maybe worth mentioning what failed to advance at the state house this morning an abortion bill that modeled a recent texas near total ban on the procedure failed to get out of committee the vote was 4-4 in the senate state affairs committee that bill would have outlawed abortions as soon as a fetal heartbeat is detected and put those who helped a woman get an abortion possibly in the crosshairs of a lawsuit the doctor, the person who drove the woman to the appointment, basically anyone involved. In Texas, anyone can file a lawsuit, and if successful, they could get $10,000, which so far, it's a law that has survived all legal challenges. Idaho's version differs for two reasons. First, our legislation would not create a cause of action to sue someone who aids or abets an unlawful abortion. Additionally, Instead of creating a civil cause of action for anyone anywhere to sue the abortionist who performs unlawful abortions, we have granted standing only to family members of the unlawfully aborted preborn baby because these family members can demonstrate that they have suffered real harm and thus have standing in the traditional sense of the doctrine. Meaning not just anyone can sue the doctor who performed the abortion, just the family could file that lawsuit. This bill was meant to amend Idaho's fetal heartbeat law, which passed back in 2020. That bill banned abortions after six weeks and would go only go into effect, that is, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, a trigger law. 
Blaine Conzetti, who you just heard from, uh, adds that if Roe v. Wade is not overturned or it continues to take its time making its way through the court systems, this bill could act as a backstop to legal challenges. Now, all that to say this. Yes, it failed on a 4-4 vote, with two Republicans voting against it. Senator Abby Lee of Fruitland said, while she is pro-life, this bill would go against existing Idaho laws when it comes to family. However, those in favor of the bill plan to rework it and bring it back before lawmakers before this session is over. So stay tuned. I was confident there was no indoctrination or affirm affirmation program at the University of Idaho. And while I was confident of that, certain conflict entrepreneurs and those who earn their living by scaring people with such illusions have made these claims, which surfaced and were used to cut our budget last year. That was University of Idaho President Scott Green mincing no words in front of the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee Friday morning. The committee, whose job it is to set budgets. The U of I budget, by the way, got cut half a million dollars last year because of accusations of social justice and indoctrination in Idaho's institutions of higher learning. Last week, School presidents were back at the state house asking for that money back, and then some. Governor Little proposed a 7.1% increase in higher education spending to $22.3 million, and it would be the largest increase since the mid-80s, when last year's cut was allowed to go through based on the belief the University of Idaho was, quote, indoctrinating students with social justice ideology, end quote. President Green, who is a third-generation vandal, didn't believe it. But he hired the law firm of Holly Troxell this past summer to find out for sure. These accusations were based on a report put together by the Idaho Freedom Foundation. If there was indoctrination, if there were classes where people were shamed for or their beliefs or their ethnicity, President Green wanted to know about it. And after a thorough and independent investigation, their conclusion came last month. And they were unable to substantiate any of the allegations contained within the Idaho F Freedom Foundation report. U of I's initiatives related to diversity and inclusion stem from independent factors and are not designed to indoctrinate anyone with social justice ideology, including students and university employees alike. Nor, Holly Troxell said, did we identify any evidence suggesting such indoctrination has taken place. They put all that in this 26-page report that they released last month. Holly Troxell also said they were unable to identify a single complaint from students, from faculty, or otherwise about indoctrination from the school's diversity and inclusion initiatives. Not one. Which is why President Green made it clear, in so many words, in front of JFAC, to correct the record. We spoke with him shortly after his remarks to the committee. The fact that they couldn't, they couldn't uh, substantiate a lot of the accusations being made, it was a bit of a relief, um, but it was also a bit disappointing because uh, you realize that this was more political than it was real, and that this was a false narrative. I think Idaho citizens deserve better, and my guess is they're not going to forget about this for a long time. Are you worried about these discussions this year when it comes to the budget? I'm always worried, you know, but, you know, my sense is, is that, you know, uh, that legislators are growing tired here of, of all the infighting and, and the accusations, and particularly if they're false. You know, I don't think legislators purposely take positions that they know are false. Um, I think they're being fed information, and they should be angry at this point, too. The Holly Troxell report also included instances where the IFF report cherry-picked program descriptions. They left out parts of them, took them out of context, to build the narrative they were trying to push. If the Holly Troxell name sounds familiar, it's because they are the same firm Boise State hired last spring after they were accused of indoctrination within their university foundations courses. An investigation that also turned up nothing. The University of Idaho gets about a fourth of its $400 million budget from the state, so maybe $500,000 doesn't seem like much. But President Green wanted to make it clear. This wasn't entirely about the money. What he wanted to make clear, and what he made very clear in so many words in front of JFAC, was about correcting the record against conflict entrepreneurs who make their living sowing fear and doubt with legislators and voters. Finding an affordable house in move-in condition in this hot housing market? That's a rarity. Almost as hard to find as what these new Boise homeowners found in the middle of their renovation. Think you have a cool story we should feature here on the 208? We're always ready to hear them. Send us the details to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget to include your name and the hashtag the 208. And you can text us anytime with your questions and comments as well. We might even share yours at the end of the show, so stick around.
A hidden gem. That's the goal of buying a home that is a bit outdated or needs some work. And that's what the mom and son duo of Melissa and Luke Brote believed they had when they bought a late 60s Boise home from the original owner. They had no idea, though, how hidden their gem would be or what to do with it now. In a hot housing market, it can be hard to find something cool. Yeah, that works a lot better than the other one, probably. Sometimes it takes a little work. Well, it's been really exciting to actually get hands on and be tearing stuff out of the floor. The Broats bought this Boise bench home about a month ago. This is the, actually the first house that my family had the opportunity of buying, so. The goal, to gut it, to clean it, and. Build it all back up again. About three weeks in, the cool part revealed itself. There were. Um, when one of the back bedrooms. Exterior shingles, I think, as a creative idea. Kind of threw them a curveball. And then they were painted this dark green. So for three weeks, I've been fretting about what might be under those shingles. My mom started and she screamed from the other room and hollered. And I came in running, hoping there was not mold. And Can you believe that? I was delightfully surprised there was not mold. And uh, I was surprised, shocked, confused. I wasn't sure what I was looking at until we continued to pull down the shingles. And found this wall of fame. Well, it is a wall, just not necessarily of fame. I mean, no offense, Dave Revering, Jack Lazorko, and Dan Schnatzetter, but if you need a Tom Needen viewer, about 1,600 two and a half by three and a half inch side by side baseball cards. We've got uh, Eric King, Dave Meads, Darnell Coles. With names and faces that certainly aren't very sentimental to Luke either. I probably could say I watched half a baseball game in my entire life. For every Greg Maddox or Kirk Gibson, there's a dozen Willie Hernandez's and Jim Ackers cornered by Bob Horner. At one point, probably worth some value on their team, just not on this wall. I've looked up a few, haven't gotten lucky yet. They obviously meant something to someone at some point, more than just Major League history. I wonder if the kid put it up or the mom put it up. This wall held some mystery. To be fair, it was probably my mom's idea, but I was definitely not going to say no. Meet Chris so Nelson. Mean. I was born in 1977. I, I lived there until, I think, late 90s. So that is, that's the wall. Yep. Oh, so wild. When Chris was still a kid. Yeah, 88 or 89 sounds about right. Just remember like going through them and sorting them. And... He became obsessed with baseball. And so I had just a ridiculous amount of baseball cards. I would say 10 or 15,000 ballpark. Like me and my buddies, that was the only thing we spent our money on. We just had all these cards and my mom was like, well, why don't we do this? And I was game. So we spent a weekend gluing baseball cards to the wall. Just a weekend? Yeah, it only took about a weekend, yeah. It was me and her and my dad all doing it. And they were the focal point of his room for about five years longer than the bucolic careers of Louis Meadows and Bruce Fields. And then shingles. And then shingles. Why shingles? Um, it just, I think at, the, at that point, my parents figured it was the easiest way to cover them up. So that covers the who and the how. What about the what now? I don't know. Guess we'll just have to figure that out. Um, I'd be open to ideas. I'm not sure what is next. As for Chris, He's okay with the wall remaining just a memory, a recollection of his collection. I've lived more than half my life without a wall covered with baseball cards. And not a barrier to the Broats making their own memories here. Just kind of, you know, whatever makes them happy to, to do with it. Not that they need to decide right away. Yeah, we have plenty of other work to be doing. Chris's parents both passed away within the last couple of years and the Broats bought the house in an estate sale and they are kind of running out of time because we spoke with Melissa today and she tells us while they want to return the house to its mid-century glory days with a few modern upgrades, they kind of want to know what to do with this wall. It's been a couple of weeks since we met Melissa and Luke and they still have not decided what to do with that wall. They tell us they'd be happy for someone to come in and take it, preserve it as it is. Otherwise, they're going to plan to tear it out and just replace it. Ideas? You know what to do. Text them to us.
All right, final minute or show of the show, the sh minute or so of the show. That's a hard one to say. Let's just get to it. I'll stop talking about it. I wish people would stop saying that increasing property values results in higher taxes. It does not. Taxes are based on an equalization rate to make sure everyone pays their fair share, says John in Boise. But then you get this comment from somebody like Otto in Kimberly. Have owned homes since mid-1960s. This year's property tax went from 1300 to 1800 this year. Been retired for years. Pretty large increase when you're on Social Security. It's, yeah, it is based on a percentage of what your home is worth, so there's something to be said about that. Anytime the Idaho Freedom Foundation is involved, one can be sure truth has little value, says Dan in Boise, referring to the accusations that our universities here in the state of Idaho are pushing an indoctrination, this social justice ideology, Two investigations now have proven that is not happening. Leave the wall. It's beautiful, John in Boise. A lot of comments about what to do with that baseball covered, baseball card covered wall in a Boise bench home. They kind of want to figure out what to do with it. Maybe donate it to a sports bar. That's an idea. That's something that's been floated. If there's a Jeff Ison baseball card on the wall, my wife wants it. Here's her, he is her nephew, says Rex and Meridian. Sorry, it's all or nothing. Can't just go in and get one. They should photograph the wall of cards, sell it as an NFT for $100,000. There's an idea.